Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacy LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Susan Getty. Susan has worked in animal welfare for nearly a decade and has a Master's of Science in Animals and Public Policy from Tufts University. As project manager for ACCND, Susan helps the organization and its mission to advance non-surgical fertility control so as to effectively and humanely reduce the number of unwanted cats and dogs. Susan, I'd like to welcome you to the show today. Thank you for having me. I want to just jump in today and mention to folks that Joyce Briggs, who I guess is she your, she's your boss or? She is, yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Joyce Briggs has been on our show a couple of times. So if folks are interested in having a deep dive, finding out more about ACC and D, feel free to go to communitycatspodcast.com, go in the search bar and you can put in Joyce's name. But quickly, before we jump into sort of your personal background, Susan, just to share a little bit about what ACC and D does? Sure, yeah. So ACC and D, it's, it's the Alliance for Contraception and Cats and Dogs. And our mission, as you said in my bio, is to humanely and effectively control cat and dog populations using non-surgical fertility control methods. And uh, we do so by advocating for different tools out there, doing a lot of research that anticipates how these tools might be used in the field. So, you know, with surgical sterilization, you can tip the ear of a cat, but with non-surgical sterilization, you won't need anesthesia. So how do I identify those cats and dogs that have been treated or even vaccinated? So we look at kind of a holistic approach of of non-surgical fertility control. The one thing about AC and C and D that really fascinates me too is that it's a very globally oriented organization, I would say. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So I went to a conference last summer, and there were presentations from all around the world of different research studies going on, and I found it to be incredibly fascinating to learn what's going on around the world. I think we sometimes get stuck in our little United States niche, and it was just really great to see that there's just so much happening in terms of research and different projects going on around the world for dogs as well as for cats, and um, I think that that trend is going to continue, so I think I find that incredibly exciting. Susan, let's find out. How did you get started in your career in animal welfare? And tell us about your passion for cats. Sure, sure. So I've sort of always lived and breathed animal welfare. As a kid, I used to hold funerals for wasps and make my family gather around. And <laughs> um, yeah, so so it's been something that I've been passionate about forever. And out of college, I went to work for a vet clinic. I think uh, like so many of us, we assume that since we like animals, we should therefore be a veterinarian. And I kind of quickly realized that this was not the career for me and was fortunate enough to get a, a second job working with people. And that was a better fit for me. And this position involved working with people who had mental and physical disabilities keep their pets. And um, it was sort of my first exposure to doing outreach to people. And I kind of realized early on that my biases were getting in the way of doing effective and respectful outreach. And I think this happens often in our field. We get so focused on the animal, which is great, but we kind of forget that people are a huge part of the equation. I mean, we care for them, we manage them, heck, we even breed them. And, you know, our biases tend to get in the way of engaging with people. And let's see, there's there's a common, uh, an example is there's a common misperception that the Latinx community doesn't want to neuter their pets. And this is just a myth. There was a recent study, I think it was the University of Denver. They have a human animal connection program there and they disprove this myth. In their study, they found that race and ethnicity were not primary determinants of veterinary service utilization. And by believing in this myth, the animal welfare field, we've missed the opportunity to help an entire segment of the population and their pets. And you figured that out in those early stages? No, it's been a long, ongoing process. I think in those first few years, I was sort of exposed. I had a a 
colleague who was just instrumental in exposing me to the, the communities in which we were working and my particular position within those communities. So since then, it's been a long process of educating myself and um, really trying to reflect on my privilege. It sounded like you had a mentor. So when you first started, did you turn to specific people to help you or to get you exposed into the field? Yeah, I, I did have a, like I said, a colleague who was, he was my first friend of color, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I grew up in a very white community and he was not only my first friend of color, but he was my first transgender friend. He just helped me realize the limited scope that I had in seeing the world and, and in viewing the world and encouraged me to consider other people's perspectives. You've been in the field for about a decade now, and there's a lot of things that you have seen, learned a lot about the animal welfare world. What are some of the thoughts and conclusions that you've come up with based on your experience of what you're seeing? You know, are there obstacles for our growth as an industry that you are seeing? Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, there are certainly voices of color um, and other marginalized voices in this movement. And I don't mean to discredit them or, or silence them in any way. But I think we are largely a white movement. And I think, fortunately, we kind of, like I was saying, I do myself, we get so focused on the animal and we kind of forget the human aspect and um, we forget that we are coming from a white perspective and so we sometimes say things that are hurtful or exclusionary so an example is you know I've seen a lot of rescue groups talk about or you know or use the slogan black cat lives matter and they mean well they're trying to get black cats adopted and that's great but in saying this it's incredibly insensitive the black lives matter campaign was started in a response to the shooting of an unarmed teenager who was racially profiled and Trayvon Martin was not the only person who was killed because of their race. There are many others. And, you know, I, I want black cats to get adopted, of course, but by saying that black cat lives matter, it sort of seems to make light of the death of, you know, black people. And it kind of makes light of racism. And I, I can't imagine how it might turn off entire segments of the population to our effort. We may mean well, but what we say and how we say it matters. And I think, I think we can do better. I think we can do this by educating ourselves about what's happening in our communities and learn more about our biases. You know, there's this great program out of the Humane Society of the United States called Pets for Life, and they are doing outreach to typically ignored communities, and they provide mentorship to shelters doing outreach across the country. Um, and as part of that, they have like a required reading list. And this is articles, books, on topics like race, poverty, policing, mass incarceration. And, you know, I'm happy to share this list with anybody. And I'm sure Pets for Life would be happy to do that as well. And, you know, I also would like to invite other people in this movement to tackle this list with me. Yeah, no, that'd be great if you would share that link. And we've had Amanda Arrington, who started Pets for Life, we've had her on the show. So folks can certainly tune in to her through the podcast. Folks, we're getting close to 300 episodes. So there's there's a lot out there in the podcast. So please feel free to subscribe and binge listen now. There's plenty to binge listen to. Susan, as we're talking here about, you know, necessary diversity, I was just trying to think of the different categories that we look at when we are talking about diversity. You know, we're talking about ethnic, we're talking about gender, we're talking about economic, we're talking about like bird lovers versus the wildlife lovers versus the cat lovers, mm -hmm. and even potentially the breeders. So we have a huge mishmash of different sort of categories that we may have been exclusive about in the past, and we want to bring them in to become more inclusive with regards to taking advantage of our programs, but also being part of our operational culture. And I think that's where the wall may exist, is that we may be going out into a community, but are we bringing them into our organizations or into our volunteer groups? And, and I'm not necessarily 100% sure that is happening. Do you see that also? Yeah, you know, it's funny that you bring up the bird versus cat <laughs> debate. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are um, organizations out there who I think are doing things really well. Um, and I think it's important for our movement to look to these organizations, even if they're outside of our cat sphere and, and copy what they do and reach out to them for advice. And one of those organizations is here in Portland, and it's called the Portland Audubon Society. And, you know, I've just been really inspired by them lately. They've taken action to kind of focus on communities of color and how they are the most impacted by environmental issues. And some of their action alerts lately, you know, I follow 
them, and they've specifically addressed racial profiling in their action alert. They supported a, a measure recently in Oregon. You know, Oregon is a sanctuary state, and they, they supported a measure on the ballot to keep Oregon as a sanctuary state. So, you know, I think I think it's important to look to these organizations who are doing things well and to try to, you know, see if we can copy them. I, there's another organization um, here in Portland that is devoted to helping the environmental movement be more inclusive and went to this event and I learned about their services and I was really inspired and I, I asked them if they might be willing to help the animal welfare community and they said of course and so I brought these materials and this resource back to a local animal shelter and I was told by the leadership that there were already too many like quote unquote good things to do on the list and unfortunately I think we just need to prioritize diversity. I, I, I understand it. I get it. There's so much to do in, in a single day and we're so busy saving cat and dog lives, which is fantastic, but we need to make it a priority. Yeah, so the work you're talking about at the Portland Audubon with Bob Salinger, who is there, and then Karen Krause has also been supportive of it with the Feral Cat Coalition. They've also, they've been on the show too, and they've become really good friends. So I'm going to give a shout out to them. I do think that the work that they've done together has been game changing. Trying to catch a pregnant cat in time? Are you after that last cat who isn't fixed in your 10-cat colony? Got a wily feral who just won't go into a box trap no matter how much you spend on roasted chicken? How about catching a litter of kittens all at once with their mom? All these tough trapping situations and more can be solved if you know how to use a drop trap. Join Neighborhood Cats, co-designers of the first mass-manufactured drop trap on the market as they demonstrate how to best use this trapper's best friend, the drop trap. A Trapper's Best Friend is a webinar presented by the Community Cats Podcast and Neighborhood Cats on Saturday, June 29th, 2019 from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To sign up, go to communitycatspodcast.com. We'll see you there. Catalogical exists to help cat parents love their kitties better with the most in-depth cat food reviews online, plus hundreds of other fact-based articles. Catalogical is your one-stop shop when it comes to learning more about your cat. Catalogical works with multiple retail partners to provide custom coupons on everything from automatic litter boxes to microbiome testing, so you're also likely to save when you choose one of their recommended products. So I'm going to give you a magic wand, Susan. Mm -hmm. If you could create change across the country, create positive programs in your local area, what would you recommend as a first step? So first step is for white people in particular to educate themselves. So often we wait for voices of color to provide that education for us, and that's not their job. It's our job to educate ourselves. So this is not just with the animal welfare movement. It's in our daily lives. So reading, you know, seeking out these voices of color and other marginalized voices, you know, there's this website out there called colorlines.com or colorlines.org, and it's a daily news feed that is multiracial, you know, it's by multiracial staff. And so you can get a perspective on what's happening in the world from voices of color. Specifically in the animal welfare movement, there is a woman named Ariana Shberti who started a, a group or an organization called Encompass. And they are focused on the farm animal movement. But I think a lot of what she says, she's got a blog, um, and a lot of what she says, like her messages resonate across all species. So I would encourage white people, that, that's how I would start to kind of seek these resources out, seek out the Pets for Life resources, look for other voices that we might not be listening to and kind of exploring our privilege. There's there's another book that I admittedly have yet to, to open, but it's on my nightstand <laughs> along with several other books. It's called White Fragility and it's by Robin D'Angelo. I think she's a sociologist out of uh, the University of Seattle. And I think the main idea behind the book is that white people, we get really uncomfortable talking about race and racism and that's not effective. <laughs> Um, we, we kind of shut down and we get defensive and a lot of times we're, you know, afraid to say the wrong thing, but I feel like it's more important to kind of continue this conversation than it is to protect ourselves and be scared of what we're saying. And we need to be okay with criticism. 
which is hard. It's really hard. Well, and being vulnerable and putting yourself out there. And I know uh, Sterling Davis, who has been interviewed, he is really working hard to encourage black men to be out there and helping community cats. And he's very active in Atlanta, um, doing a lot of trap new to return there. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's been hard. I mean, when I interviewed him, I didn't expect this, but he was talking about so much of the challenges that he has with people responding to him because he may not be saying the things on Facebook that people are used to seeing out there and he's the trap king and you know that's his brand and that's how he's building himself up and he works with a lot of women he's got a team behind him we just had him on the online cat conference with uh, Adam Myatt out trapping in Oakland California and they've got like Catman TV now and Mm -hmm. crazy stuff like that but there's different ways of communicating that we need to understand and and being able to make sure that all doors are open and accessible, you know, there is no one right way. And we have to be aware of that. And, you know, at the end of the day, let's create an environment so that then the cats in our community, as well as you say, the people in the community are getting access to the services that they need. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of times, you know, we assume, you know, we see a dog that looks sickly or a cat that looks sickly and, and we assume that the owner is not caring for that animal. And in reality, it might just be that that animal, you know, has a parasite or has mange or something that's, you know, easily treatable. And it's just that that owner was unable to access the resources that, you know, in a way that you and I might be able to access them due to financial resources or transportation. If you just break down those barriers for people, then they are able to get the care for their animals that they so desperately want. Well, and I mean, the other thing to to say is we do need to be more diverse in our businesses. I know I run into this challenge working with this group in Chelsea, Massachusetts, north of Boston, and we don't have many people in the group that can speak Spanish. And that's a problem. That's a mm-hmm. big problem because it's a primary language in that city. So it's very challenging. Also, we have quite a few people involved in the group that don't live in Chelsea. And, you know, you want the core of the group to be um, equal representation presentation of the residents. And so because you don't want it to seem like you're bringing services in it, you want it to be like, these are services that are at home and that are part of the community. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's been great because they've actually asked us to participate in a program in the school system, but you know, it needs to be run by folks within the school system as part of the community, not coming in to do something, but growing something from in the community. So it seems like it's the same, but it's very different. Something grown locally does a lot better than something brought in. Oh, of course. And there's always people in the community who are already interested in, in animal welfare. We It's just a matter of supporting those people and their own agenda. And like you said, not bringing our agenda in. Exactly. So yeah, and I had this other burning question on that conversation of diversity. I've had people tell me, and I believe conferences are extremely valuable and have a great sense of worth and education, but I've had people say to me that they're a little intimidated about going to conferences. So I know we've been talking about these other categories of diversity, but there's also somewhat of a level of intimidation by just an individual person who cares about cats and might want to make a difference in their own community, but they're kind of scared to go to a big conference. So trying to figure out a way to reach that group. And that was one of the reasons why I started the podcast was because this is a very lonely business for folks that aren't part of an organization that are volunteering or just out there trapping cats or, and I say just with very, very small letters and making sure that everybody is able, anyone can listen to this podcast. So, you know, the barrier for entry is very low. I think we need to do a lot more and and not even just barriers, but we need to create invitations too. No, I I agree for sure. I think it's great that there are podcasts like yours and and other resources out there for people who aren't able to, for whatever reason, get to HSUS Expo. It's wonderful for those people who are able, but you know, like you said, not everyone's able to do that. Is there a way for folks to find you if they have follow-up questions based on our conversation today? Of course, they can email me, but I would actually encourage people to not try to find me, but instead try to find voices of marginalized communities. Um, we've got a lot to learn from them. So there's not much I can teach people, but there's different perspectives other voices can provide. And I think we should do a a better job of seeking those voices out. And I'm going to put a shout out to the Community Cats podcast community. And if you feel 
like you are doing something to help bring these barriers down to be more inclusive. You know, share your stories with us. Share them you know, with me, you certainly can email me at stacy at communitycatspodcast.com. I'll share it with Susan. Sounds like this is a very important topic for you, Susan, as well as for me. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's critical for the growth of the work that we're doing for cats. And, um, and I, I think that if we don't start playing together more, then I, I don't see how we can create a humane cat community all across the country. We have to all work together for this. But please share what you have going on in your community so that then we can learn more and be able to tackle this topic. Susan, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? No, I mean, just going off of what you just said, I, I again, I really want to encourage white people in particular to, to tackle this issue. Don't be afraid to not do anything. You know, it's, it's important. Step one is to educate yourself, but also encourage other people to have this conversation it's really important, you know, especially with the privileges that you may have. You may be cisgendered, you may be able-bodied, you may be heterosexual, and it's important to seek out voices of transgendered folks or you know, disabled persons or queer people. I mean, it, it's not just a matter of racial diversity. It's it, any voice that's not your own. Seek those voices out, listen to them, and then from there, take action. That's great. Susan, I want to thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. Anytime. Join us June 21st through 23rd for a kitten-focused event presented by the National Kitten Coalition and the Community Cats Podcast. This three-day virtual gathering will feature presentations by experts on raising and saving kittens, setting up and managing kitten-centered shelter programs, and more. Early bird tickets are available now through April 30th for just $50, and after that, $75 tickets will be available through June 22nd. So don't wait. Sign up for the 2019 Online Kitten Conference.